What's up, Barefoot Nation? Today, I'm gonna give you guys an early summer garden tour. Let's go! So I'm gonna start off today in one of the sunnier areas of the garden. I know that I've mentioned this tree in the past, but this is a service berry. It's called a service berry because these berries are actually edible, and you might actually be able to tell that they kind of resemble blueberries. Um, but I don't grow this plant for me to eat the berries. I grow this plant as a wildlife tree for the birds. You'll get tons and tons, if you grow this in its native range, you'll get tons and tons of different uh, native birds in your area who will love to eat this and, uh, and it feeds them, it helps nature. But just backing up here, you guys can see the, in, this bed in its entirety. Uh, basically the service berry tree is the focal point and uh, as it continues to grow, I'm pruning the low branches up. Another eye-catching plant, well there's really several, but another eye-catching plant at this point in the year is the Summon Substance Hosta. Now I love hostas and particularly the big ones. Um, this guy is about five years old here and I planted it out from about one, it, I planted it out from a one or two gallon container, but definitely a small pot. But I love the contrast of the Sum and Substance Hosta with the Zounds. Actually, it's not a contrast, it's kind of echoing. Believe it or not, that's a different cultivar of Hosta. This, of course, is my beautiful Empress Wu Hosta. And she hasn't bloomed yet, but uh, you can see actually right there that it's just starting to happen. We're in uh, the summer solstice was yesterday. Moving back towards the entryway of the garden, you can see a nice little patch of uh, typical orange daylilies. Right next to it, I have a beautiful variety of miscanthus who is growing into its own very nicely. Um, but that miscanthus grass is gonna bloom early in this uh, autumn and provide some interest in this area once the daylily has finished flowering. And these daylilies do bloom longer as they get older, but when they're young, they're not gonna bloom for very long. Moving along this way from the daylilies, you can see a nice little, uh, <laughs> little, it's the size of the shed, <laughs> uh, a nice white bird of paradise, otherwise known as Strelitzia nicoli. Um, this is a lovely plant, I've had it for I don't even remember how many years. I've had this thing for a long time, but only recently have I started putting it in the ground for the summer. You can see this big, beautiful new leaf coming right here, which is awesome. And also, I'll get a machete out or something of the sort and cut that leaf off. Moving along this way from the beautiful white bird of paradise, which by the way, it's a little bit windy. You might hear the leaf Normally the wind chimes don't blow, but the leaf moving in the wind kind of helps that to happen more often than it normally would because they're in kind of a protected little corner. But uh, here you can see the iris versicolor just finishing up their bloom. Um, this is another species of uh, plant that's native to the northeastern United States. Um, actually, I'm going to hold off on telling you about these for a minute because I forgot, nearly forgot about one of my favorite uh, wildflowers as well, and that's the Indian pink, otherwise known as Spigelia marylandica. It's literally like this thing evolved for human cultivation because it reblooms naturally. Spigelia probably would bloom continuously throughout the season or something close to that if you continually deadheaded it. I don't have time to do that, so uh, for me, it blooms once in July as it's about to, and then again in September. But it's just a beautiful little plant. Um, generally grows about two feet tall. They look terrible in pots, guys. All right, so when if you get the chance to buy one at the nursery, I highly recommend it. Um, just be mindful of that. They're gonna look terrible like two little twigs in a pot. Um, give them a few years in the ground with good compost rich soil and they will look like completely different plants. That being said too, don't disturb them once you have them in the ground in a spot where they're happy. 
um, you probably wouldn't want to disturb their root ball or do um, anything too drastic. But yeah, so anyway, about these irises. These are definitely one of my favorite species. Um, one of the reasons I like them is because it's not an iris that you really have to dig and replant every few years. You know, like with bearded iris, you have to dig them out and divide and kind of mess with them, reset their, their rhizomes every few years. Iris versicolor, you don't have to do that. Also, they'll bloom in quite a bit of shade, as you can see if I get down kind of to the irises level here. Um, you'll notice that they're in quite a bit of shade. They basically only get a few hours of sun um, during the day. And they still bloom pretty nicely. Probably not for as long as they could if they were in sun, but uh, hey, I'll take what blooms I can get. And I'll insert a picture right now of what they looked like in blossom. This is kind of like, the, the name versicolor means of varying colors. So it just so happened that I got a lavender plant there. And then there's a clump of seeds that, that's, that seeds that fell that are kind of dark purple there. And then this plant here is like different shades of purple and lavender kind of medium to dark and this plant is kind of dark and then now these seedlings which i didn't plant these at all see i love nature look how perfectly these are spaced it's like you would swear that they were planted but they're not and then of course one of the telltale signs that it is in fact earlier or at least not late in the season is you can see just how small my elephant ears all start at the beginning of the year um, you'll see in my September or late season garden tour, whenever that happens, um, how much the growth these guys actually put on every year. It's truly amazing. One of the reasons for that is, although I did toss a light coat of mulch, um, under the soil is heavily amended with compost and manure and all sorts of organic ways to feed the soil. And then when you have happy soil, you have happy plants. So uh, this is kind of the jungle garden, I like to call it. Really no very, there's not no rhyme or reason, there's very little rhyme or reason to this bed here. I have a hedge of winterberry, which uh, haven't even flowered yet. They're going to in the next few weeks here. Um, you can see the honey locust tree, and then I actually have a folding lawn chair that I keep folded so that all the birds that pass through don't poop on my seat. Here you can see a beautiful elderberry native shrub with beautiful large white flowers like a Queen Anne's lace on steroids. I worry that people would view this and think that it's hogweed and then kill it. Um, there's quite a difference in aesthetics between hogweed, which is a noxious weed that's actually dangerous, and the elderberry, but they do have but they do have similar flowers. Got a new species of clumping bamboo in the ground, new species for me anyway, uh, Fargesia dracocephala. Hopefully is gonna grow into a nice big plant. Of course, there's the river birch, hasn't made its surge of growth just yet, but it is starting. I forgot to mention this too. This is some volunteer tree. It just kind of popped up um, a few years back. I I think it might be an edible cherry. I have genuinely no idea, but I am very curious um, if any of you guys can identify this tree. It's some kind of cherry. I just don't know what, but uh, if you can identify this tree for me, that'd be great. Starting off with the grasses, and of course they look really good. The one in the su that gets more sun looks better, obviously, because in most cases, grass is like sun. Got some nice variegated hostas. I'm really loving this combo here. This was one plant, and there's some celery weed in there too, but this was one piece, little four inch pot of sweet woodruff, and it spread into that in two years. The edging is keeping it contained. You can kind of see the black edging right there. Uh, but I love the colors of kind of, and the texture change in this little area. And of course, the volunteer bleeding heart 
is doing well. It blossomed nicely this year. And those textures all kind of meld together nicely with the, uh, with the peonies who have finished blooming and I need to cut their dead flowers off. Moving along this way, you can see that I planted a little pink china elephant ear in here. Um, mainly, main reason for that is because the peonies oftentimes get uh, powdery mildew and I'll cut them to the ground early in like August. And obviously in August, there's still quite a bit of time in the season left. So I planted something tropical there that would really come into its own later in the season, but still be hardy. The pink china is definitely one of Definitely a fantastic variety of elephant ear, um, if you've got the sun. Uh, guys, just check out this bamboo here. So you can see just how thick some of these columns are. This is a running bamboo. This is Philostachys ariosocata, which is said to be a very aggressive runner. And it, and you know, it does spread four feet a year. But as you can tell, I rhizome prune it and keep it contained. But look how thick some of these stalks are getting. Columns is the technical word just absolutely incredible um, and uh, conversely when you have thick stalks this is a four-year-old plant when you have thick stalks makes for keep going keep going keep going holy cow guys have a look at this bamboo I mean it is literally I think it's probably as tall as the house and it's a two-story house it is unbelievable I mean, I never, I expected it to be big, maybe like 12 feet tall. I never would have expected it to be the level of like the gutters of the second story. I mean, I'm just loving watching these things grow every single day. And of course now they're branching out. So now they're, you know, they're done growing upwards, but just watching them grow, I would literally leave in the morning and come home at the end of the day and the shoots would be like a foot taller, sometimes more as they grew. As they continue to grow, they get to, uh, their growth rate accelerates. It's an incredible sight to witness. So the bamboo is just incredible. I did actually remove a couple columns so that I could see the stems a little bit better. Um, you know, just so that you can enjoy the beautiful form of the plant. But um, moving on to my planters, I am very careful with how I arrange my planters aesthetically. Um, and this corner here is, uh, has a whole bunch of different planters. There's a Christmas palm, which is kind of the main focal point. And essentially what I'm looking to do is create vignettes. So basically the palm is the focal point and then all these other planters are just supports for the palm to make the palm look better. Different textures, different colors, and um, of course they're all tropical. They all can be truly tropical because they're all in pots. Um, so basically there's a host, there's a range of different sized uh, containers and generally I do them in odd numbers, but um, like this philodendron, uh, I'm calling it a philodendron bilitae, even though I'm pretty sure I don't think it is a bilitae. I think it's a Berlin Marks, but um, I prefer the name bilitae for uh, <laughs> ideological reasons. Anyway, um, the impatience here, um, I actually need to water these guys on a regular basis. And this is actually a good lesson in not they're not wilting yet or they're slightly past what one of my horticulture professors would call relaxed and essentially you can see that like you can see that these impatiens are relaxed they're not quite uh, perfectly perky but they're just slightly showing signs of wilting whereas these guys in fact are more classically um, wilted. But what's interesting is you can tell that the soil is not totally dry because anyone who grows sweet potato vine is very well accustomed to how much they like to drink too. Here I have a Hedicium coronarium and the Hedicium really does want full sun but in this case it only gets morning sun. I'm not too concerned, rather I'm not expecting it to bloom 
this season at all. I just got this from Plant Delights Nursery. And then the last plant that's really not visible in this vignette is a little rattlesnake calathea. And, but it is visible. It just adds a nice little detail when you're sitting here uh, in this chair. It's just little things like that, filling in shady corners. Over here I have a lady palm. And uh, this guy doesn't change too much throughout the season. It does obviously grow. One of the things I want to touch on with how why native plants are important in your garden is uh, this plant when I brought it home from the nursery in late April, early May was uh, not loaded with mealybugs, but it had them. And there were wasps, yellow jackets and different um, native paper wasps that uh, found this plant and found the mealybugs within hours of it being outside. So one, of my one of my new favorite taros is the lemon lime gecko. And that's this guy right here. He, it is just an unbelievable taro, very fast growing, and that's one of the reasons I love it so much. Um, but the stems are beautiful, the leaves are beautiful, and it contrasts the Kelly Ray potato vine very nicely. So this little plant right here is a coffee shrub, or a coffee tree, and uh, this, is, this plant is probably my favorite fruit tree per se, because I love my coffee. Of course, I have a curcuma scarlet fever who's just now starting to wake up. Now that the heat is consistently here in July for the next uh, little while, um, just an awesome plant. And then over here might be one of my favorite um, planters, and that's this black and white planter right here. This is not as much of a vignette as I was originally hoping. Uh, I think once the this colocasia was supposed to grow a lot faster and it didn't so basically what I'm doing is I'm using this spindle palm to somewhat shade the monstera adansonii and the variegated peace lily while the colocasia takes its sweet time to grow and shade the plants once the colocasia does grow to shade all those plants it'll be probably about to the height of this um, piece of siding here give or take and provide good shade I'm going to move the spindle palm kind of to where the umbrella is but in the meantime um, I've got them kind of all jumbled up together I'm calling it the black and white planter because the variety of colocasia or elephant ear in here is bikini teeny so it's got almost truly black stems and black veins and then of course the white variegation in the peace lily then the Monstera adansonii is just green, but there's no real flower color. As far as vignettes go again, um, you can see I've got a Picasso calla lily, which will add a little bit of color, a little bit of purple and white once that guy blooms. Um, I tend to put callas and other bulbs in tall skinny planters just so that they have the root space, but they don't generally take up a ton of of width. And then of course at the base of the spindle palm I've got some new plants in here. I've got some Tigridia or Mexican shell flower and then I've also got Impatiens, a tricolor stromanthi and then this potato vine here used to be a uh, I believe it was called uh, south of the border chipotle but it has reverted back to a green potato vine so what I'm curious about and maybe you guys can help me out in the comments is is this edible now because it's reverted back to green moving here this way of course now we're getting into the main tropical garden guys look how giant these bananas are I mean this is July here in the Northeast Musa Basu is probably not usually this big until August um, yeah <laughs> so this is just incredible and I know that the chair here the little lawn chair is not the best looking thing but I'll show you the vantage point so again maybe the lawn chair isn't the most uh, attractive looking thing on the patio but again just to sit low to the ground and look up through you know to literally be sitting under the bananas especially this early in the summer 
is just an amazing thing. I got Elephant Ear Lane over here, and most of these taros are Zone 7 taros. Um, this is a Colocasia gigantea which, uh, species form, which is supposed to be hardier, but I'm starting to question if it is in fact the species form because the species is going to make pups readily, and it hasn't yet. But it doesn't have the same leaf, so I'm not exactly sure what's going on there. Over here I've got a Bikini Teeny elephant ear that has returned from winter. Uh, basically all these elephant ears that you see here have returned from winter. Um, I've got a typical colocasia bulb on the end, basically on each end, so right uh, here and right here I've got typical elephant ears. This is another pink china and as I said that's a Bikini Teeny. Uh, I've got basically the south wall loaded up with different, potentially different uh, plants. Right here you can also see that I've got a second year Zingiber Mioga white feather. Um, in the, yeah, so this is kind of elephant ear lane and uh, this is near the old clump of Musabastu who has had pink china growing at the base for years and years and then there's a little rose that somehow flowers even though the bananas <laughs> totally eat like all the sun. And then of course as you can see moving this way I've got my beautiful Fargesia rufa here which was planted in 2013 out of a two gallon container so it's grown a ton since then but if you look this year um, well I would have I would have had to show you earlier in the season but this is basically as tall as it's gonna get is this shoot right here so just so just about six feet you know and that's totally fine I don't need a bamboo to be you know eight or ten feet tall because really it would just start to kind of get in the way that would be too big so you know a six foot tall clumping bamboo is absolutely perfect and then I'm sure as you can hear we are right next to the koi pond and I'm gonna do a separate video on the koi pond one year later um, because this truly is a this deserves its own video uh, it's just amazing to watch all the plants mature and the ecosystem to continue to grow I mean like I said I can't believe that it's one year old I mean it looks like it's been here forever I mean just I love this pond but yeah so here's the the pond garden and the view of the pond with lots of different this is kind of a part sun area um, I've got a crocosmia I hate the name crocosmia lucifer right here but it is reliably hardy unprotected in zone six um, and then of course here this is a hardy banana that I think I told you guys I planted it last year I've had to you know this is an area that I've used to test banana hardiness it's further away from the house so basically to test how much mulch in the Northeast you need for bananas and um, also it, it seems as though I've stumbled upon the same uh, genome or at least a similar not the same gene. As you've been probably looking at, uh, I've got some unbelievable, just beautiful Colocasia gaulagongensis. This has been here since about 2016. Um, it's proven to be a pretty hardy taro. Um, even if, like, basically last year was a really tough winter, it didn't emerge until now. La this time last year, it was about this tall so it's there have been years where only the tiniest of corms have lived through the winter and then there are other years like this you know where I it certainly helped that I really over protected them essentially and that we had a zone 7 winter and you can see that these elephant ears are the same size basically as the ones that I dig and replant so it's just amazing um, and the, as it happens, the sweet potato vine isn't taking off, uh, which is good because taro has a shallow root system, so I don't really want them competing, and I'm actually happy that the taro is kind of 
serving as the ground cover this year. But just another beautiful area. Moving this way, uh, you can see another one of my planters. I'm actually going to show you this cluster from up on the patio because again I've designed it to be kind of like a planting clump. I've got a alocasia black stem and then just a little baby New Guinea gold who was kind of throwing a bit of a fit when I first put it outside for the for the summer. Uh, again the alocasia was designed to shade the canary wing begonias but um, didn't happen and uh, the canary wings have since adapted to sun, which is a-okay. Uh, I'm not sure that I like red and purple. I certainly do like the yellow and purple and the purple and green, so uh, I think once that alocasia takes off, it's going to look a lot better. Uh, and then, of course, this planter is kind of echoing a lot of the other planters with the elephant ear, the potato vine, and then this new plant, the... Uh, I think they, it's, it's an irisini, but I, it's like Brazilian or blazing or, um, I'm not exactly sure. Um, but, uh, testing it out, I really loved, if you guys don't know, one of my jobs is working in a propagation greenhouse. Um, and this is, uh, a plant that caught my eye from across the way in, um, even just as tiny little cuttings, just like little tiny cuttings. Um, planting them up so uh, you know it's just been lovely to enjoy the plant growing it out and of course since it's in a planter with a, a tropical with an alocasia basically any of these plants that can take a frost are going to come inside and be saved so I'm hoping that these irisini can take uh, at least one frost uh, the potato vine generally doesn't but we'll see and it'll be lovely to show you guys how they all these things continue to develop as the season goes along. Uh, I've got a um, NSAT Ventricosum that I actually grew from seed. Um, well, it decided when it wanted to grow. The thing didn't sprout until August. And then I've babied it, essentially. Not babied it, but I've really kind of pampered it uh, to some degree or another until it got planted out. It is in too much shade, and one of the consequences to that is they do lose that. They have, their newest leaves have like a beautiful uh, waxy glaucous coating to them, and it's got a bluish cast. Uh, and then in too much shade, they're also gonna have not quite as much uh, red in the center vein, the mid. Kind of the aeroid that grows nearby the banana, kind of one of my design things here is a Monstera deliciosa. Um, so that guy is a beautiful, kind of a slow growing, uh, sometimes. They're, they grow fast kind of when they want to. Once they're well rooted, they grow pretty fast. But, uh, this guy is recovering nicely from before, getting planted before the trees and all the shrubs leafed out and it was in too much sun. Here you can see the pond, basically the entire water feature and all the lilies and, you know, beautiful plants and then there's another monstera a little tip with your landscape guys is you want to repeat elements throughout whether that's variegation or ferns or you know um, a certain texture or plant you want you don't want to have two of everything and even if you do even in a garden like mine which has a lot of different varieties having repetition in the case of like the summer sweet has a and they're wilting yes has a very similar flower to the skip laurel but the skip laurel has that white skinny tall skinny white flower in spring and summer sweet is just about to have that uh, flower as you can tell i have a shade garden so there's lots of different types of ferns there's lots of different types of liriope or lily turf um but I mean, this is kind of a great example right here of how you repeat elements in a design. So you've got ostrich ferns, you've got uh, autumn brilliance ferns, you've got sensitive ferns right there just peeking out of the water, and then different hostas. So um, different variegated hostas. So 
they're different varieties and it's and it looks slightly different um, just varying things up just enough as you can see the lights automatically flick on at dusk um, I'm not sure the lighting looks pretty good on camera but um, the pond at night is an absolutely beautiful spot to be in um, basically anywhere at night and then of course the frogs will start singing more at night uh, I'm not sure if we can see oh there's Jeremiah I have a uh, couple I have like three different frogs there's uh, two bullfrogs I might have four frogs actually at this point there's two bullfrogs there's two green frogs and um, they kind of come and go as they please And as you can hear, the cicadas are now also starting to sing. And the cicadas are definitely a sign that summer is here, you know, and uh, pretty soon the katydids will start singing. I'm not by any stretch of the imagination whatsoever, and even like, I don't know most insects. I am not good with my insects. But I do know kind of the keystone summer sounds, which really when you think about it are insects. I mean, there's frogs in the spring and summer, but, you know, the cicadas, kind of the katydids and stuff like that. And I'll do a video on native plants eventually and why they're important, but uh, as far as supporting your ecosystem locally, um, but that's for another day. Alright guys, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this earlier-ish. I hope you guys enjoyed this garden tour which happened a little bit earlier in the season, so you kind of got a, a bit of a better idea as far as my sequence of bloom and what I have blooming in the garden, kind of like not just late in the summer. So uh, in any case, if you enjoyed the video, give it a big ol' thumbs up. And uh, if you want to see more content just like this, then be sure to hit that subscribe button and tap the bell. Lastly, I'd love to hear what you guys thought of the video and what's growing on in your garden. All right, guys, I'll catch you on the next one. Thanks for watching. And then I want to hear from you guys. What's going on? What's growing on in your...